Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. This is episode 199, and I am your host, Jeremy Lesniak. I want to thank you for tuning in. Thank you for spending some of your time with me. I know that you have plenty of stuff that you could be listening to, whether that's music or other podcasts. And honestly, and I don't know if I've ever said this, but the fact that you choose to spend some time with this show with me means a tremendous amount. Thank you. If it wasn't for you, as I've said before, I would just be a crazy guy talking to myself and taking the time to record it and post it online. Today's episode is going to be in sort of two sections. We're going to talk about episode 200, but the heart of today is going to be our third installment of our question and answer section. I've been collecting questions over the last, well, since whenever we did the last Q&A, and we've filtered them down. We've got some good ones for you. It looks like I've got, let's see, one, two, four really solid questions that I'm going to talk about, answer, give you my thoughts. But first, let's talk about episode 200, because 200 episodes is kind of a big deal. The majority of podcasts don't even make it to episode 10. Very few make it to episode 100. We're here on episode 200. Well, almost episode 200. Episode 200 is going to be very different. It's going to be the first ever live episode. It's going to be live streamed, in fact. And we've got some details on how we're doing that. This coming Monday, from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m., that's Eastern Time, we're UTC minus four if you're international right? If you're on the West Coast of the US, it's going to happen at five o'clock your time. If you're, let's see, who else we've got? We've we've got some some friends on, you know, Australia that are 12 hours plus. Well, anyway, I'll let you figure it out. (laughs) Ivan Vervat will be recording local time. So you can use Google to figure that out if you aren't sure of the time shift to the East Coast of the US. As I said, we will be live streaming this primarily using Facebook Live. That was not the original intention. The original intention was YouTube Live, but YouTube decided on one random video that we did something that was in violation. They wouldn't tell us what it was. Uh, That video was flagged, and now we can't do any YouTube Live stuff until 90 days have passed. I did reach out to them. I said, hey, what did we do wrong so we can avoid doing it again? And they said, you did something wrong. Goodbye. And that was pretty much the summary of the email. So <laughs> so no YouTube Live, and I apologize to those of you that do not have a Facebook account. You should be able to watch this publicly, regardless of having a Facebook account. I can't be sure because we didn't test that part of it yet, but I believe that is the case with everything that we do. We set everything as public as it can be. We are looking at other options to simultaneously stream. Periscope, which is part of Twitter, is likely the second choice. We're hoping to have, you know, that kind of redundancy, that backup there. How are you going to know about all this stuff? If you're not on Facebook, the best way is the newsletter. I will be putting out a newsletter Monday morning. That's the 26th of June, 2017, to let you know where we're going to broadcast, when we're going to broadcast, how we're going to broadcast, all that good stuff. And that way you can watch. Not just watch. I want you involved. I want you to help make episode 200 something that you're going to enjoy. Because this show is not just about me. It's about this community that we're building, this greater martial arts realm that I am so honored and proud to be part of. And to that effect, I want to know what you want out of episode 200. I want your questions. I want your comments. I want your shout outs, feedback. Why do you listen to this show? If you have something that you're willing to share, send it in. Two best ways, email us, jeremy at whistlekick.com. That'll go right to me. I'm the one pulling all this stuff together. Or you can direct message us on whatever social media you choose. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter are the three primary that we use, but we also do some stuff with YouTube and Tumblr and what else? Google Plus. I don't think anybody uses Google Plus anymore, but we're there. If you're there and that's the way you want to get to us, go ahead. We will see it. Now for the Q&A. Our first question comes in from a multi-time guest, Sensei Jared Wilson, host of Martial Thoughts, our, our good friend, my friend. And he writes, I want to hear about cross skills, skills learned in one martial art that actually carry over to another martial art, how much actually does, how closely related were the arts, 
and all that. I, I paraphrase, those weren't exactly his words. I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this, but I've trained in, in a number of different schools, and I can say that once you have a good understanding of one martial art, you're going to be able to pick up other martial arts easier. And I know that that's really subjective. So let's say red, brown, first degree black belt. Once you get into that level of competence in most styles, you're going to be able to step to another style, even if it's dramatically different, and learn faster and learn more because the body only moves so many different ways, right? So as you become a better martial artist, you're understanding the way that you learn best. You're understanding the way your body moves and how to translate instruction to knowledge because those are two very different things, right? It's it's a spectrum. You've got to take the instruction coming from your instructors and convert that into something that you understand and use it repetitively and become knowledgeable or at least have a, a comprehension of what's happening there. Obviously, the more similar the the arts in practice, the easier that translation is going to be. Striking arts are going to adapt better to other striking arts versus, say, moving from karate to uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu or from kendo to sumo. Obviously, there's going to be a benefit. Maybe not. Obviously, there is going to be a benefit, but it's not necessarily going to be one-to-one. -one. I remember when I moved from karate into taekwondo, that was in some ways really easy. In other ways, it was really hard because there were some subtle nuanced differences that I had decades of unlearning to do, or at least not unlearning because I still remember the way I originally learned them and I still practice those at times. But the repetition, that sort of second nature methodology of, of performing certain movements had to be adapted. And that, that actually could be really hard. Overall, it certainly is easier to learn a martial art for the second time than for the first time. Hopefully that answers your question, Sensei Wilson. All right, our second question comes in, and I didn't get permission from this person to read their name, so I won't, but did you see Yair Rodriguez fight BJ Penn? Hopefully yes. What did you think of his Taekwondo kicking? He threw over a dozen different kinds of kicks and destroyed BJ Penn. Could this spark interest in traditional martial arts skills for MMA? One of the things we don't talk about on this show very much is MMA, and there's a good reason for it, because there are dozens, if not more, podcasts out there dedicated to MMA. I don't participate much in that world. You know, I, I Or this past weekend, I watched a, a friend have uh, an MMA fight. He won. It was great. Shout out to Sensei Raz. But we don't get into the... Uh, the relationship between traditional martial arts and mixed martial arts very often. Certainly it's there. And most of the time I'm going to leave you to draw your own conclusions and connect those dots for yourself if you so choose. But here's a great question, because typically when we talk about the relationship between traditional martial arts and mixed martial arts, we're talking about people moving from traditional martial arts to mixed martial arts as if that can only happen in one direction. And here this question is coming in about the potential other direction. Obviously, as a spectator sport, MMA has completely dwarfed what we do as traditional martial artists. You put up in even an amateur MMA fight in a local area, and you're going to see a ton of people who have never set foot in a gym show up and watch. That doesn't tend to happen at a traditional martial arts event. So could this help increase interest? Absolutely. I think anytime someone demonstrates a high level of skill in an effective way, people are going to respond to that. I did not watch this fight when it aired. I actually don't watch a whole lot of US, UFC events. If I'm visiting someone or at a restaurant or a bar and it's on, I'll certainly watch it, but it's not something I seek out. Now, I did go back and I did watch a good part of this fight and the question is is completely accurate. There were a lot of different kicks thrown, and they were definitely coming from a more traditional perspective. Anybody that watches full contact or MMA stuff knows the signature of, say, a Muay Thai kicker or someone who learned how to kick strictly from their MMA fight camps. 
And that is not what Yair Rodriguez is bringing to the table. He's bringing some solid kicking. I don't know his background, but you can see in the way he moves that he can kick. And he's practiced a lot of kicking. I mean, there were there were spin kicks. There were some kicks that, honestly, I've never seen used in an MMA fight before. And he used them effectively. My hope, of course, is that that will spark interest in what we do in karate and taekwondo and kung fu. Because it's all there. It all comes from there. Regardless of what you're doing in, in, in some kind of MMA gym or in MMA fight. I, th- I want everybody doing some kind of traditional martial arts, but maybe I'm selfish. All right. Question three, what is the right amount of contact for training? What is too much? What is too little? What's appropriately going to train someone as a martial artist? What's excessive? And that came in from Master Adam Grogan. And I want to give a shout out to Master Grogan, who was on episode, let's see, how's my memory? One, two, three. Five? Yeah. Master Grogan was episode five. I did not look that up ahead of time. Uh, I actually had someone commenting. I was um, recorded for an interview earlier today and just talking about the number of episodes and I was able to rattle off episode numbers for a couple of the people and they were impressed that I could remember them. And honestly, I remember most of them, at least uh, give or take 10 to 15 episode numbers. So Master Grogan, episode five, also the host of the Northeast Open tournament where we will be set up. That's coming August, uh, what is that, 13th or 14th? It's Saturday in Albany, New York. We'll be there. If you're anywhere in the area, this is a wonderful event and uh, you should go. No, he's not paying me to say that, but he lets me come and set up and it's a fantastic event. They actually outgrew their previous space. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Well, Master Grogan's question about the right amount of contact for training. And I think we've got to break that down to the reason for training. Contact is a stimulus. Everything we do in martial arts is based on a stimulus response. It might be a mental stimulus. It might be a physical physical stimulus. Contact relates to a physical stimulus. What's the easiest way to think about that? If you get hit in the face repeatedly, doing what you're doing, you will probably change what you were doing until you get hit in the face less. That's pretty obvious. How hard do you have to get hit in the face to make that adaptation though? And that's going to vary based on a lot of things. Why are you training? If you're training for health and because you enjoy going to train and making new friends, seeing your existing friends, getting better, you're probably not going to enjoy contact as much as someone who is looking to compete. And that person, you know, if they're looking to be a point fighter, they're not going to want as much contact as someone who's doing continuous fighting or full contact fighting or MMA. The more contact you expect to come into in your application of martial arts the more contact will be appropriate. What's too little contact? Too little contact would be anything that does not promote a response. I think most of us have worked with newer students and maybe we dial back our level of contact. We don't want to hurt them. But as people progress, they need need to take a shot once in a while. And maybe that doesn't need to hurt them, but to keep them humble or to point out maybe some of their, their failings. We've certainly, at least most of us have worked with someone who thought that they were much better than they were. And the stimulus of a bit of contact is one of the best ways to get them to realize that they're not hot stuff. Excessive contact is anything. Well, I think there's a couple ways we can look at it. You've got the far end of the spectrum, which is anything that's going to limit somebody's ability to train. Yeah, we could break somebody's nose to illustrate a point, but they're probably not going to come back to train. We could break somebody's ribs. That's going to make it difficult or even impossible for someone to train adequately. So that's too much. 
I would say it's a question of control, like anything else. Using enough force to get the desired result and not using more. So that comes back to the why. If the person is looking to compete in some way, they need more force. If someone's stepping into a full contact event or an MMA event and they've never been hit hard, they're probably going to react poorly the first time they take a good shot. So conditioning that stimulus to understand what the response is going to be. There's a, a greater coming down my road. For those of you that, that may not know, I live up a dirt road in the woods and it's wonderful. I have lots of animals, but one of the downsides is that dirt roads need a lot more maintenance than a paved road. And right now there's a greater going by. So if there are bits of time where it seems like I stop talking, it's because the audio levels are indicating to me that it's picking up the greater and I'm just pausing until it goes by. It just went by. So it'll be coming back shortly. Our final question today comes in from Mr. Donovan Barrett, who's one of our brand ambassadors. And I believe I'm recording this on his birthday. So happy birthday, happy belated birthday when this comes out to Donovan. And thanks for this question. What would you say to someone who wants to start martial arts, but feels that it's not something they're able to do? And that's a fantastic question. We've tackled variations of this on the show, mostly around where to train and why to train and how to train, but not so much overcoming someone's resistance to training. And there's plenty of reasons someone would not want to train, but if they feel it's something they're not capable of, that's a point where we can and even should step in. It doesn't mean you make someone train, but we've got to show people that the martial arts are for everyone. That's that's really important to me. Hopefully that's important to you. Hopefully if you've been listening to the show for a t- bit of time, you understand why I feel so strongly about that. And maybe I've swayed you a little bit. How do we get them to understand, though, that it is something they're able to do? You got to dig into the why. What is it about it? For a lot of people, there may be some physical stuff going on, whether that's an actual physical limitation, someone has some kind of physical condition, um, a mental condition, perhaps. I think you've got to break it down to the real limitations versus the perceived limitations. Real limitations, I would argue, are going to be less of a factor than the perceived ones. The individuals that I know that have some kind of um, limitation, I'll keep using that word, generally know what they are able to do and what they're not able to do, and they're willing to push that boundary. They want to do things for the most part. Martial arts schools, by and large, from what I've seen, are places that are very happy to work with people that have some different needs. Adaptive individuals is a term I often hear. So I don't think we're so much talking about them. It's the perceived limitations. Perceived limitations are something that can be debilitating. When someone gets it in their head that they can't do something, well, they're right. Whether you say you can or you say you can't, you're right. You know, we've heard, most of us have heard that quote. You got to dig into what it is. What is it they think that they can't do? Maybe somebody's seen something on television or in the movies and they think that that's what's expected of them on day one. Obviously, that's not the case. Maybe they feel that they are too inflexible or too out of shape or too uncoordinated to progress in martial arts. Obviously, we know that that's not the case. We are martial artists. We've been in that space and we've seen the amazing progress that some of the least physically gifted people have been able to accomplish. I know quite a few people who started martial arts at, you know, significant disadvantages, be that, you know, inflexibility or being overweight. And in the span of a a year or two, are completely different people. Gentlemen who are 
six, three, four, five that couldn't get their foot above their knee when they started martial arts are kicking to their own head. I mean, that stuff blows me away. I love it. I love watching that. In almost every case, you're trying to get someone to try. Come to class, give it a shot, recognize that it's not going to change overnight, but be willing to persist. Maybe tell them your personal story. If your story doesn't really resonate for them, maybe there's the story of someone else that you know, someone that faced similar insecurities about stepping into martial arts. Because that's really what it comes down to. Someone is afraid. They've set up these mental barriers around training, the idea of training, because they're afraid of failing. We live in a society that does not reward the attempt. We we reward the, well, that's not what I mean to say. We do not live in a society that rewards people for trying to make a go of things. We reward them for stepping in and participating. But we want to see people achieve and achieving requires effort it requires time not that that quick result bring them to a class maybe you can work with them on the side individually you know if your instructor's okay with that maybe give them the lowdown i've done that with people before say hey all right i'll i'll spend a couple hours with you a couple times i'll give you an overview of what you're, what you're going to learn in your first couple classes. And that way, when they step in, they feel much more confident, especially after the first class, when they realize they already know more than was expected of them. It's all about giving people some comfort and setting their mind in such a way that they're open to trying. And they're open to failure. And they realize that not doing something correctly the first time is okay. Heck, it's martial arts. It's all about that personal growth. That's why we do it, because we want to become better people. Right? That's it. That's question number four, episode 199. Episode 200 is coming up. This episode is going to release on Thursday, June 22nd, just four days until episode 200. So please get me your stuff, whatever stuff you want, to put out there. Um, we've even got a way of putting out some some photos or some video. So if you want to get us some of that, you know, if you're doing something impressive you want to share with the martial arts radio family, get that to us. Comments, questions. We're really looking for your involvement in this show. It would mean a lot to me. I know I ask a lot of you all out there. Hopefully I give you far more than I ask. This is the one time I'm really going to sort of beg. It would mean a lot to me to have your involvement in this show. If you're not able to watch live, it will be recorded. It will be broadcast later on. So don't worry about that. But I want your help. Email me, social media messages to us, whatever it is. We're looking for questions that I can answer. We're looking for comments to read on the air. We're looking for feedback personal accounts, stories. How did you find the show? Have you shared the show with someone? Did the show change your life? <laughs> uh, if it did, hopefully for the better. Although I've, I've received some feedback from people that have come in in the last 20 episodes and they're committed to going back and listening to every episode quickly. And man, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of time. I don't know if I can listen to myself that much. Thank you. Thank you as always. I look forward to talking to you again. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great 